for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Jacob Altus. I'm here with uh, students of mine. Uh, Chris Abra Burton and Diana Carrier. And we'll be talking about the challenge that we developed for uh, this competition. And our idea, the actual motivation for the project was that starting in 2002, we started working on humanoid robots. And um, we started on flat, even surfaces, and we got better and better at that. But for these robots to be really useful, they need to be able to maneuver over more varied terrain. And our dream is to develop a robotic rescue ro um, workers or uh, firemen. And for that, they would need to work over very complex terrain like um, rubble piles. And so, since we knew how to walk through the soccer challenges, we were pretty good at walking on even floor. But rubble piles is, is really very tough. Uh, nobody really has any idea on how to do that properly. We wanted to look for an intermediate challenge that allowed us to make some progress and come up with some more interesting walking gates and learn from that in order to finally achieve goals like the very complex environments. So we started looking at skating, ice skating in particular, uh, because it has very interesting kinematic and dynamic properties. Uh, skating is not walking on ice, and we're also talking about inline skating, not skating on four uh, wheel uh, rollerblades, which is kinematically, dynamically very different. And the first uh, difference is that the ground reaction force on your cert on normal walking or rollerblades is uh, fairly, uh, it's the same in the X and Y direction. You can push off forward or backwards. If you're walking on ice, then proportionally the forces that you can exert are scaled down, but you still have the ability to push forward. But when you actually attach ice uh, skates to the robot, then that's just not possible anymore. Um, so the, in this case, the ground reaction force going backwards and forwards is zero. That you can't actually push uh, in that direction, but you have a very strong ground reaction force going sideways. Which is why, um, so then when you look at the standard way of humanoid uh, control for walking, uh, that's based on the zero moment point, and uh, the zero moment point is the point where all the moments uh, around that point are zero. Uh, if that point is within your foot or in, within your support polygon, then that's your zero moment point. If it's not, like you see in the figure below, then it's a projection of that point onto your support polygon at that edge. And in this case, uh, if that point is not within the support polygon, your foot will start rotating upwards. Now, on the skates, we don't actually have an edge because the skates are rounded, so that point moves with, within itself. And sideways, because the skate is very thin, we're basically constantly outside and our uh, skates are rotating left and right all the time. So the uh, dynamics are very different. Um, as far as walking control is concerned, if you uh, compare them, then the standard approach is to use the zero moment point trajectory, use a 3D inverted, uh, linear inverted pendulum model to come up with a control which keeps your zero moment point within the support uh, polygon. And you can here see the movement of in yellow of the zero moment point and in green of your center of mass. Uh, that's also based on having no slippage. But in ice skating, because we cannot push backwards, uh, the motion is very different. Here's a little video clip of uh, skating. You can see that because we cannot push uh, backwards, we have to push sideways and the hips are moving and in fact going over a lot further than during normal walking games. So, <laughs> for simple skating then, what you need to do is you need to angle your skates outwards a little bit and instead of the zero moment point traversing from the heel towards the foot, you're actually trying to keep the um, point of pressure on 
in the center of the blade because that pressure is what's going to melt the ice underneath the skate, which gives you the film of water that you actually skate on, that you actually uh, glide on. Uh, you also need to lower the center of gravity because A, it gives you more stability, and B, it gives you a longer push, longer work angle that you can use. Uh, that requires a lot of uh, torque on the joints. Uh, so this is the, the simplest kind of skate. If you do that, that's beginning kind of skating and you see people with the center of mass uh, inside between their legs all the time. If you're then going into advanced skating, uh, you need to move your center of mass actually over your support leg. So instead of having it between your legs, it has to move over and in fact, you exert a push, uh, a double push face in skating would be um, pushing this way first, then you're rotating in, and then you're pushing, this is your strong push then, which actually accelerates you even further. Uh, that's a very advanced skating technique. If you do that, you're an Olympic caliber uh, skater. And you can see here the, the pass of the uh, zero moment point in the center of mass is different because it actually overshoot, so it sort of switches sides when going from left to right. Um, so then, based on, on this uh, idea, some analysis, we started designing ice skates for uh, Darwin. Um, the skates, we went through various iterations because they need to be wide enough so that uh, they give the robot a, a film of water to glide on so they can't cut into the ice too much. But they also need to be thin enough so that the weight of the robot and the push of the robot exerts enough pressure to melt the ice underneath uh, the robot. Otherwise, the robot is going to be stuck as well. So after three versions, uh, we ended up with the skates that we use. Um, <coughs> unfortunately for the demo here today, we don't have uh, any ice surface. Um, next time we'll have to have the conference in Winnipeg when it's minus 35 in the winter, then that won't be a problem. We'll just spray some water quickly. Uh, so we also built some inline uh, roller blades to at least demonstrate some of the principles of uh, the gates that we developed. So uh, I'll now hand it over to Chris who will talk about the actual implementation of the simple and advanced skating <coughs> Uh, that we developed and the ice hockey plane. Hi. So our very first attempt, we have a Darwin. We know that the Darwin chips with a very robust walking module can walk across lap terrain very, very well. So the first thing we did as a baseline was, well, let's just put skates on it, stick it on the ice, and see how it walks. And as you can imagine, because of the narrowness of the skate blade, it does not walk very well. The skate blade is simply too narrow to support the zero moment point and it falls over during the single support phase. Our second attempt was to again use the walking module but adjust the parameters such that we can obtain a stable skating-like gait or a, more of a shuffle really. So in this case, we lowered the Z amplitude of the stride to keep the feet very close to the ground such that if it starts falling, the other foot will catch the robot very quickly and it won't fall over completely. And we tilted the toes outward, the yaw offset in the walking configuration, so that we're pushing against the sides of the skate instead of just going straight back along that zero friction axis. And then finally, we had fairly short X amplitudes. We had fairly short, quick steps. And we discovered that this actually improved the stability of the walking to the point where it could move at a, between half a centimeter and two centimeters a second depending on the ice conditions. If it's warmer out, the ice is a little sticky. If the ice is dirty, there's you know, snow and frost on it, so we slow down a little bit. And we have a video of... So this video is showing that modified walking gait with uh, one of our earlier prototype skates. So you can see the robot's making reasonable speed. And again, this is just with modified parameters on the stock Darwin OP walking gait. Um, the ice is a little bit dirty in this case, which is why it's moving a little bit more slowly than it did at other times. But you can see that it's fairly small, short, shuffle-style steps and is making progress across the ice. 
So finally, after establishing that a skating style gate was at least possible to Darwin, we started looking at how do we get away from this walking gate and develop something that is truer to a skating gate. That's what we're going to be demoing in a little bit. This basically, instead of a walking gate where the feet move along the sagittal plane forwards and backwards, our gate, the feet move entirely in the coronal plane. So they're side to side motion, we're pushing against that high friction axis on the skate blade. The ankle angle changes significantly to maintain the center of balance over the skate blades. And with this gate, we were able to achieve a top speed of, again, not terribly quick, but between one and three centimeters a second. Uh, again, depending on ice conditions. So this was a significant improvement over the, just the modified skating or modified walking gate. And here we have some stills of the skating gate which we'll be demoing. You can see that the robot leans very heavily to one side and then to the other. And there's very, very little movement in the sagittal plane. So in terms of balance, uh, on this is the raw gyroscope data we collected on the Darwin. Uh, this is in the coronal plane. At the top we have the gyroscope data for several walking strides on flat ground using the stock walking gate. In the middle we have the same walking gait but on skates. And you can see that it's highly erratic, there's no cyclical pattern to it at all. It just does not work, the robot falls down. But finally at the bottom we have the skating gait. And you can see that we've restored that cyclical stable motion again. The robot exhibits uh, consistent behavior that we can use to move across the ice. But of course, us being a team from Canada, simply saw it skating wasn't enough for us. Canada loves hockey, so we decided to take this one step further and make a robot that can actually play hockey. And to our knowledge, Jennifer, uh, our robot, is the first ice hockey playing humanoid robot in the world. And we did most of our testing outdoors on an outdoor rink just on, at the University of Manitoba campus. And the reason we decided that hockey would be an interesting challenge is it shares a lot of superficial similarities to soccer, something we've been doing for several years. The goal is to put an object into a goal. So the, the differences really end there, but the goal of the game is very simple. The difference is in soccer, whenever you manipulate the ball with a robot, you're kicking the ball in the same line that you're traveling. With hockey, when you're dribbling a puck, you have to alternate between a forehand and a backhand motion and push the ball or the puck across your line of travel, which requires a lot more thinking in terms of visual feedback. So you can see here, well, this is one of our early attempts at puck control. And unfortunately we don't have a hockey puck and the table is just too high friction to really do a satisfactory dribble, but you can see what it looks like. So this is skating on ice while manipulating a puck going forward. So finally, because we were doing all of our work on an outdoor skating rink, lighting was a very serious problem. As you can see in this picture, we have really high glare off the ice where it's in the light. We have dark shadows. The, and day to day, the lighting was completely different. You have cloudy days, you have sunny days, you're doing the afternoon, the, in the morning, in the evening. So to deal with this, we redeveloped all of the vision processing of the Darwin. We wrote our own camera class to replace the Linux Darwin camera. And we use OpenCV for the pre-processing. Uh, we normally just do a Gaussian blur, but we can do anything else. We need filters, whatever, scored by OpenCV. And we've developed our own uh, object recognition algorithm that uses a scan line segmentation and a filter cascade to identify objects based on the aspect ratio of the bounding box, the compactness of the object, and it, the color parameters based on YUV, RGB, and difference channels. So ultimately, from this we've learned that hockey is a novel of application for humanoid robotics. We've received a lot of media attention in Canada because of this. Uh, like I said, Canada loves hockey. Uh, we've had national TV spots. We were on the Discovery Channel. We were interviewed on the radio in Chicago about this. And because of that, we've been able to go out into the community and really get a lot of interest in robotics, which is fantastic. We've been to a few high schools, a few elementary schools, just demoing what we do, getting young kids enthused about doing robotics, which in the future will push research forward even more. 
and ultimately our goal with this is to learn lessons on balancing and moving on low friction surfaces that we can pull back and apply to walking over uneven terrain, loose gravel, debris fields, and try to build that robotic firefighter that is our long-term goal. So, as you can see, we focus our research mainly on the push phase of skating. Without a strong push, we just can't glide. So, that future work is to get that sustained glide motion that we saw in that speed skating video. But, if I tip the robot up... If you look at its foot motions, they're largely across this plane. There's very little motion forwards and backwards. We do have a little bit of a kick. Uh, at the end to compensate for the drag on the stick on the ground. <laughs> Otherwise the robot starts leaning to the left and skates in circles. We've got that extra little kick just to push it back to the right. And it's programmed to skate. It finds a ball, it tracks which side of the stick it's on so it knows if it has to do a forehand or a backhand shot. And... Like so, at that point I think we can wrap up most of the presentation and open up the floor to questions.